What's good, Josh? Your boy Ross back at again with another video. So, I'm going to check out 10 worst wrestling matches with the best builds. Now, this is, I guess you can say, a rare occurrence. It doesn't happen often where the build to a match is really well. Like, the feud is intense. You're buying into um, the, the competitors, their gripes with each other their issues with each other you believe the story that they're telling with the feud only for the match to get there and it falls flat whatever the case may be the match doesn't flow well or you know people lose interest in the match after such an amazing hype which does happen um but it it, it can kind of bring down the entire feud if the match doesn't live up to how good the build is and i think a lot of times Fans have gotten accustomed to buying into the build more than the actual match. I've seen it, you know, a few times where, you know, the story and, and what they were trying to tell leading up to the match was fantastic. And then fans kind of lose interest when the match actually happens. So it's not all the time that that does happen, but the times it do happen, the, the, the rare chances where the feud is really, really good and the match is just bad, it you know it's one of those things there that you know sometimes it occurs so we're going to check out some of those moments when it did happen uh appreciate all the love and support you guys shown on the channel let's get right into there this are one, countless examples of hot feuds that just couldn't cut it come crunch time inside the ring yeah. and the best or worst of them are here so enjoy reliving epic well thought out story beats then cringing when remembering what happened next when yep. it arguably counted most so i am gareth here from what culture wrestling and here are the 10 worst wrestling matches with the best builds number 10 bret hart versus vince mcmahon when wwe wrestlemania 26 bret yep. hart's unlikely wwe return in 2010 remains one of wrestling's most obvious too late guys moments the hitman wasn't physically the same as he'd been 13 years earlier during the montreal screwjob day wasn't even cleared to bump but vince mcmahon was determined to put a bow on that story once and for all so he and brett tussled in an awkward mm -hmm. calamity of a match at wrestlemania 26 before getting there though the pair worked in some wonderful dueling promos that mm -hmm. whisked people back to the late 1990s at times hart seemed legitimately fired up at vince and things looked promising if significant bells and whistles were used to help them brawl yeah. brett patched things up with old enemy Shawn michaels then received a swift boot in the balls from the man for daring to expect the same apology it was dramatic it was over the top and it was deserving of better than the heart clan almost turning vince babyface by accident come mania oh what yeah. could have been eh number nine adam cole yeah nah it, it's that should have been a lot better considering how real the feud and situation was all those years ago it did not land it did not stick the landing uh more or less it was like a a cool visual to see brett standing over vince triumphant but the match itself was to be desired is being nice about it versus chris jericho when aw double or nothing 2023 this is a super recent example of frankly dreadful payoff to a story that rumbled along quite nicely on television both chris jericho and adam cole played their roles to the uh -huh. hilt on episodes of dynamite and rampage the latter c show even included a thumping pull apart hockey style fight that you needed to see throughout cole played the fiery baby face who couldn't be stopped with a plum and jericho knew exactly exactly when to act like a coward. Yeah. ECW original Sabu even dropped by as Cole's insurance policy against the Jericho Appreciation Society. It was wrestling 101, I say. But then the bell sounded at double or nothing and things just fell apart. It was a total bummer, to be honest. Jericho and Cole worked a painfully slow, unsanctioned match that yeah. barely made use of Sabu's AEW arrival or thrilled fans at all. The 19-minute yeah. clangor sucked and might actually be one of the worst All Elite pay-per-view matches ever they just couldn't match the hefty build come pay-per-view time now let's take a break from the negativity for a second and i want to ask you what's been your favorite AEW pay-per-view match ever let me know in that comment section right down below this video yeah it didn't it didn't land once again few was i wouldn't say it was great it was enjoyable what they were doing it was definitely cool wouldn't like the best but it was good it's just you watch that match it's it's a lot of people just kind of quiet in the in the crowd, just like there. It's never really a good sign, considering these are 
the the most over people in your company. Like it's people just didn't care. Video. Number 8, Randy Savage versus Jake Roberts. When WWF Saturday Night's main event, the 8th of February 1992. This could be a controversial one, but eh, uh, here goes. Wrestling will never forget that snake-biting angle Jake yeah. Roberts and Randy Savage worked on Superstars towards the end of 1991. It was one of the most shocking things that had ever happened on WWF screens, and it should have led to ultimate revenge for Randy. Macho sure. Man and his snake-loving nemesis had exactly three matches after that. One of them happened on an MSG house show special, another came at the This Tuesday in Texas pay-per-view, and the other was in early February 1992 on Saturday night's main event. Sadly, it lasted approximately five minutes and didn't properly Damn. avenge Jake's evil behavior. The brief scuffle was heated, but there was something missing. If anything, their rivalry had become so violent, it needed to peak on a big-time pay-per-view. For Vince sure. Man had other plans for both come WrestleMania, though, so they were landed with an uninspiring blow-off in the end. Number Number seven, Becky Lynch. Yeah, nah, if you let your fucking pet snake bite me and I can't escape, it needs to be personal. Like, you know, it needs to be, we need to have like some real type of stipulation and a bigger pay-per-view. Like there needs to be like pull aparts. There needs to be like a match that decides it all type situation, like a hell in a cell, you know, obviously, you know, hell in a cell wasn't really a thing back then at that time, but I'm saying something that lets the fans know, like, this has gotten real personal, this is not a normal match, they're gonna try to murder each other legitimately in the ring, so, they, you know, it could have been handled better, you know, considering how personal the feud was supposed to get. This is Charlotte Flair versus Ronda Rousey oh, when WWE WrestleMania yeah. 35. Firstly, it's important to say that these women deserve to headline WrestleMania 35. For sure. Or to be more accurate, Becky Lynch versus Ronda Rousey deserve to main event the biggest show of the year. There Charlotte Flair was just kind of thrown in there by Vince McMahon during the bill to add extra value. Fans had been teased with the man versus the baddest woman on the planet for a while though, so there was something unsatisfying about the queen just poking her nose in. Regardless, things looked promising when the trio worked a dramatic parking lot brawl skit. That's that shit was cool. If that WrestleMania, I think that was the WrestleMania where it was like fucking eight hours or some shit. It, I think that may have been that WrestleMania. I think that may have been the, like the last WrestleMania where it was like damn near eight hours. Should have been a shorter WrestleMania. But they deserved the main event. This whole parking lot brawl, even though Charlotte shouldn't have been in the mix, this shit was cool though. <laughs> this This was... This was just a cool segment. Saw cops show up to arrest them following some seriously meaty strikes. That the Mania match cool. just couldn't live up to the billing Ooh. in the end. It was little more than a standard triple threat that came at the end of a long show. And the botched finish. My bad. It wasn't eight hours. It was five hours. Look at that. Long show. Five hours, bro. That's just as bad. It might as well have been fucking eight hours. That's a long ash. No, everyone's tired at that point. I think everyone's just like ready to go home at that point. That's why I'm glad they do WrestleMania two nights. At first, I wasn't a big fan of it, but I've gotten accustomed to it and it works. And it gives, you know, people the opportunity to really, you know, more people the opportunity to have that WrestleMania payday. And you can compare which night had the better night. And the past few years, they've been pretty solid. This year's past WrestleMania was pretty damn good. Still, night one was fucking fantastic. Night two had some good stuff on there as well, so I'm glad they shortened it. But, I mean, what can you do when you've been on a... You're main eventing a show. People are tired. It doesn't matter who was in that damn ring. People were tired just being there at the arena longer than five hours for sure. So Watching wrestling at one time, it's only so much you can take. Oh, and the botched finish certainly didn't help. This is another what could have been situation for WWE. Bex versus Ronda would have probably been better on its own. Yep. Number six, Brock Lesnar versus Goldberg. The infamous when one. WWE WrestleMania 20. Yes, this belongs here. No, don't don't make that face. It does. It does. All right. The beauty of WWE's build towards Brock Lesnar versus Goldberg was simplicity. Yep. Creative didn't over egg the pudding by trying to squeeze in awkward comedy or too many gimmicks. Instead, they had Brock brag about being un 
Unstoppable at Survivor Series before Bill muscled in to say, uh -huh. Oh, you think so, son? From there, Lesnar attacked Goldberg during the 2004 Royal Rumble and paved the way for Kurt Angle to eliminate him. Uh -huh. Seeking payback, Bill interfered in Brock's uh -huh. WWE title defense versus Eddie Guerrero at No Way Out, and Lesnar blamed him for losing the belt. But that's when things went south. Simple. Steve Austin was wheeled out as a special guest ref, which diluted the focus slightly, but oh, yeah. was still tolerable. Then news spread that both Brock and Bill would be leaving the company immediately after Mania. Infamously, MSG fans trolled both and made it impossible for them to get on with a powerhouse showdown. Oh well, the build was fun at least. Number five, Hulk no, the Hogan. The build was really fun for that match. It's just once they found out that both were leaving, it didn't matter. The only people, the only thing that people cared about was Stone Cold being the the special special guest referee, but no one cared. The fans. The match wasn't even that bad. It's just no one cared no more. It's like, well, y'all both leaving. Fuck you guys. That's... It's crazy. Wrestling fans, that's how they can be sometimes. <laughs> Gun versus Shawn Michaels. WWE SummerSlam 2005. Oh, brother, 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 do you? Brother, 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 brother. This is sort of what Shawn Michaels <laughs> went for when ripping the piss out of Hulk Hogan's promo style during a parody skit on TV <laughs> heading into SummerSlam 2005. So <laughs> At this point, HBK was invested in the rivalry and clearly wanted to make the most of it. That would change, though. Nope. It all started so well. Michaels and Hulk had actually been unlikely tag team partners before Sean delivered a killer sweet chin music so to old Terry in July. After that treachery, Michaels went on a rampage, ridiculing everything about Hogan's nostalgic act, and things seemed set up for a winner on pay-per-view. At SummerSlam, Sean took it upon himself to oversell like nobody uh -huh. had oversold before. He was mocking Hulk's favorite spots by bouncing around like a character from the WWE All-Stars <laughs> video game, and that absolutely ruined the match. Or made it if you're a Hogan hater. Number four, Triple A. Yeah, it's obviously the, the infamous story of it was supposed to believe it was supposed to be three matches and Hulk only wanted to be one and done. So he went out there and just said, fuck it. <laughs> it makes it for me. It makes the match funny. I know for others, it can be like, what the fuck? Like he's really taking the piss out of it. But for me, it makes it just a little bit funny because, bro, he was overselling like crazy, bro. Is Batista when WWE WrestleMania 35. Give me what I want. Batista yep. yelled that at Triple H <laughs> countless times during the build towards their Mania 35 clash. Give me what and I want. With a volley of saliva, <laughs> Big Dave got borderline comedic as he hollered with entitled rage about his destiny and whatnot. Some might argue that the feud dipped a bit during all of that, but one angle on the 25th of February 2019 edition of Raw was iconic. There, Batista uh -huh. battered a helpless Ric Flair and dragged him around the arena. That as was, trips led Rick's birthday celebrations. That was a cool, like, visual. Everyone's celebrating Ric Flair. We don't know where he's at. And then you see Batista dragging this nigga Ric Flair's corpse across in the back. All because he wanted a match with Triple H, bro. That's it. All because he wanted a match with him. That's it. <laughs> live in ring. It was one of the most provocative moments it fans have witnessed in years. It was could cool. the match follow it? Yeah, no, 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 it couldn't. Nope. Their no holds barred match went 25 minutes and it was a long 25 and featured such spots as Hunter ripping out Dave's nose ring. Perhaps Batista tripping during his entrance should have yep. told everyone what kind of night they were in for, eh? That flair beatdown was fab though. Yeah. Number three, Sting versus yeah. Hollywood Hogan when WCW Starcade 1990 it would have been easy for Eric Bischoff to hot shot Sting versus Hogan into the ring way earlier than he did. But Bish knew the WCW versus NWO story, with Stinger acting as the former's final line of defense against the latter, should headline Starcade 1997. So Sting stalked the faction for approximately one full year and performed several memorable <laughs> Batman style sweepdowns to fend them off on TV. Anticipation was at a fever pitch by the time the match rolled around. And Hogan beat the snot out of Sting like he was some nobody. That continued for far too long. Then a screwy finish handed WCW the world title back, and fans scratched their heads as to why the hero hadn't vanquished the villain when he really needed to. Enjoy the glorious build, but skip the match. Number two. Yeah, once again, politicking. It it just it just one thing Hulk Hogan gonna do. He gonna politic him with his. He going to politic himself into a situation where he will always somehow look a little bit strong, even in defeat. <laughs> 
Dean Ambrose versus Brock Lesnar. WWE oh, WrestleMania 32. Yeah. Dean, not quite John Moxley again. Ambrose oh. must have been in Dreamland weeks before tangling with Brock Lesnar at Mania 32. WWE dropped the goofiest side of Dean's on-screen personality and played up to his CZW origins by letting Ambrose tease ultra-violence in skits with heroes like Mick Foley and Terry Funk. Uh -huh. Everything from a barbed wire baseball bat to a damn chainsaw was teased during passionate skits. That's all legends encouraged Dean to literally cut down Brock on the biggest yeah. show of the year. Sadly, Lesnar wasn't really feeling the thought of nope. working with Ambrose, and he phoned in his performance overall. Their match just turned into a semi-squash. It was slow, the violence wasn't anywhere near as extreme as the build suggested it would be, and again, Brock was visibly disinterested. Let's just say this was incredibly poor lead-in to Dean's WWE title win later that same year. Number one. Yeah, no, that shit was... That... I ain't gonna hold you, bro. I remember watching this feud. I was like, I'm here for it. I'm here for it now. I, I, I'm, I'm invested. I am here to see what happens here. Because I want to say this is right around the time where, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I want to say it was Roadblock. It was Triple H versus Dean Ambrose. And it looked like Dean Ambrose could have pulled off the ultimate upset and beat Triple H for the title and become the new WWE champion. Like, people were really pro Ambrose at this time. That didn't work. He didn't win it. And then they ended up doing this Brock and Dean Ambrose thing. And people, once again, were into Dean Ambrose at this particular time. And they were wanting him to, you know you know, get some momentum going. And when they announced this was going to happen, we all knew that most likely Dean Ambrose was going to lose the match, but they sold it as a guy that will take punishment and will dish out the punishment. You're going to have to damn near put him down to legitimately beat him. Like, it was good. It was great. The buildup was exciting. I was like, okay, he may not win, but they're building up this ultimate underdog baby face that's that's willing to go to Suplex City. He wants to go there. Like, all right, I'm here. And then once we find out that Brock didn't really want to do a damn thing that Dean Ambrose suggested, oh, the match was, the match was dreadful. It was one of the worst matches. It was a waste of our fucking time. It was awful. Hollywood Hogan versus Kevin Nash. When WCW oh, Monday Nitro, man. the 4th of January, 1999. The majestic NWO story that shot WCW to the top of the industry was almost three years old by the time tensions boiled over between original members Hollywood Hogan and Kevin Nash in January, 1999. Seizing the moment, company chiefs promoted a war to settle the score between the NWO Hollywood and Wolfpack leaders on Nitro. Oh, not. You see, the entire thing was a sneaky plan whipped up by Hogan and Nash to assume total control of WCW's world title all over again. The dreary finger poke of doom yeah. turned their hotly anticipated main event <laughs> into a farce and had approximately 40,000 folks Whoa. inside the huge Georgia Dome wondering why they'd purchased tickets. That... Some say this moment started WCW's rapid decline. <laughs> in truth, creative rot had started to set in before that, but dreadfully ill-advised guff like the finger poke did nothing to help fan confidence in the product. That terrific build towards an NWO implosion had been utterly wasted. And that's our list. No many other bad wrestling matches with the best builds. <laughs> that, bro, imagine you paid that fucking much money for a nigga to get hit with the finger poke of doom and then it all be a fucking ruse. Not even a good one. Not even a good swerve, a good turn. You just like, what? Oh, fuck this. Fuck you. <laughs> Politics. Politics at its finest. Comment down below. Let me know some other, um, I guess you could say, builds to matches that, like, the builds itself were fantastic, but the match was not good at all. Let me know if they weren't on this list, because there's a few that uh may have uh that weren't on this list that could have been on this list but i appreciate all the love and support you guys shown on channel road to 150k and i'm still in the speed of youtube wrestling chip of the world appreciate y'all kicking in with me see you on the next one peace